Welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium, along with our partners Shareable and the Kresge Foundation. I'm Julian Adjuman, and together with my research assistants, Megan Tenhoff and Perry Scheinbaum, we organise Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative which recognises Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning and sustainability issues. Today, we are delighted to welcome Setha Lowe to be our Wednesday colloquium speaker. Dr. Lowe is currently Distinguished Professor of Environmental Psychology, Geography, Anthropology and Women's Studies. That's a lot. Uh, and she's Director of the Public Space Research Group at the Graduate Centre, City University of New York, where she teaches courses and trains PhD students in the anthropology of space and place, urban anthropology, culture and the environment, and cultural studies in historic preservation. She's been awarded a Getty Fellowship, an NEH Fellowship, a Fulbright Senior Fellowship, and a Guggenheim for her ethnographic research on public space in Latin America and in the United States. She's widely published and internationally recognized and translated for her award-winning books on public space and cultural diversity. Her most recent publications are Spatializing Culture, the Ethnography of Space and Place in 2017, The Anthropology of the City in 2019, and Spaces of Security in 2019 as well. Her talk today is From Spatializing Culture to Social Justice and Public Space. Setha, a Zoom-tastic welcome to Cities at Tufts Colloquium. Yes, thank you so much, Julian. Thank you, Megan, and everyone else for being here. Um, though you will learn as I talk, and I don't love Zoom talks. I don't get to see all of you while I talk, but here I am. Um, and first, I want to um, share with you that I am on the Shinnecock Nation's land, and they have graciously allowed me to share this land with them. Um, those of you who do not know about the Shinnecock tribe struggles for recognition out here on the East End um, should maybe, you know, bring it up to date that there has been a lot of activism here and um, in solidarity with Jeremy Dennis and other artists that we've been trying to do collaborative projects in art uh, to bring more attention to the fact that, um, that we are graciously allowed to share this land. And um, it's with that, um, with that welcome to all of you. Um, I also wanted to say that I have been inspired by your leader, Julian, um, in this talk, in that he has gotten some wonderful talks for me. And what he has been able to um, do is really integrate his body of work, his career of work into where he is now. And this is my attempt to do it, um, though I hope and I hope that I um, can do it in a minimal amount of time. But I, I'm gonna start by taking you on a journey towards justice through some of the work that I've done as a scholar um, to the book I'm currently writing, which is Why Public Space Matters. And then to the meat of this uh, subject, which is how we can in fact create a framework for understanding, planning, evaluating, and actively moving towards uh, social justice in public space. So the journey for me really starts in Costa Rica and Latin America, where I spent about 15 years doing research, trying to develop a multidisciplinary method for the study of space. Um, anthropologists have ethnography, but I was trying to bring together uh, planning methods, uh, architectural methods, environmental psychology methods, and put them together so we could have a fuller and more robust understanding of public space in general. And during that project, I learned something uh, about co-production and the co-construction of space. Um, I also became, uh, the evidence began to show me how uh, vulnerable and fragile any social ecology is in public space. And that when uh, Parque Central, one of the main plazas that I worked on, the central 
Plaza of San Jose was redesigned to clean it up. It resulted in the exclusion of users. And more recently, Plaza de la Cultura, they've done the same thing. They took out all the benches and all of its diversity um, disappeared, which is one of the first lessons I think about the relationship between the design of public space and social justice. The next period of field work for me, and that's what ethnographers do, they go to the field for a long period of time was in uh, Mexico and Texas and New York. Uh, and it was a, an ethnography of gated communities. I went from looking at really very public places that did have open access like Latin American plazas to the most exclusionary spaces. I was really quite concerned that I should understand spaces that were excluding people intentionally and that where the desire for safety and security really was rationalizing and legitimizing the social exclusionary practices. Uh, gating, um, I made very clear, comes out of the evidence is a racist and class project. Um, but I also learned a lot about the affective and architectural infrastructure of exclusionary strategies. By that, I mean how walls, gates, and guards, and so many other aspects of our built environment uh, reproduce a fear of others, and how once we have put that into the landscape, it continues to produce, reproduce, and reinforce uh, this fear of others, social segregation, social exclusionary practices. I should probably say that people often ask me why I do what I do, but it all started that I became very interested in how the middle class and myself included, uh, particularly a white middle class, but um, it it, 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 ex it expands, whiteness expands its boundaries, as we know, um, really designs the world in order to resegregate and reinforce uh, structural racism. It's one of the structures that I feel, though, Julian, you do a wonderful job of really bringing that to the fore, but I think for social scientists in general, I think they don't understand how, how much the built environment is a tool in constantly reproducing, reconstructing, reinforcing um, racism in the landscape. And that I always wanted to get to the bottom of it. And I wanted to do it by not necessarily just looking at uh, the people who were suffering, but actually the instigators of those programs. So you do, I did something what is called studying up. So again, a little out of the usual anthropologist mold. Um, the next book after, or there have been many books, but the next project was about 20 years of park studies uh, that I did with the public space research group that uh, uh, they mentioned that I'm the director of, and which I became very concerned with the developing methods that would work to increase and understand uh, large parks. I worked for the Park Service. We did contracts with the state of New York. We did um, work with the city of New York. We worked in the city of Philadelphia. And we developed a REAP, a Rapid Ethnographic Assessment Procedure, something you could go in very quickly and help parks or plazas or public space or city officials really understand what was going on there from a cultural point of view. And then from that work, um, we came up with a number of lessons that we really feel undermine uh, cultural diversity in parks, including um, the fact that if people aren't represented in a space and their landscapes and uh, buildings of importance are erased, um, they will not use the space. And of course, we think a lot about um, how space is commemorated now with the statues of Confederate uh, generals and how that might create an affective and symbolic gesture of counter representation of injustice. Um, we uh, worked on how access to a space is not just um, whether it's open with bars, but whether there's economic and cultural access. And there are lots of barriers to the use of space that people don't think about when they think about culture and how people want to use it, um, which leads to that you must accommodate cultural differences in your public space if you want the kind of diversity that we were reaching for. Um, you need to provide safe and adequate territories for all. And even as you do that, you want areas that will circulate like Prospect Park, where there are many, many ways that you can be in the park and yet 
there is a central walkway where people come together. And finally, that you need to restore uh, the function, not the fa facade, just the facade in historic preservation projects. And finally, um, this ethnographic work um, sort of culminated um, in this book, Spatializing Culture, that came out in 2017, where I try to put together the theories that I'd been developing about co-production, uh, affective infrastructure, um, and the methods, the REAP method, and the uh, original sort of multidisciplinary ethnography into this book called Spatializing Culture. And be focused on and really made a much clearer statement that by spatializing culture, making it visible, we can uncover hidden strategies of social injustice and exclusion. I also began to work on a community-based tool. As I began to feel more confident in my work, I became really aware that this is work that we all can be doing in our own communities. And people were asking me for some way that they could evaluate their own parks and use these ethnographic methods, um, it, be it in Caracas or in uh, Kuala Lumpur or in Nairobi, and uh, developed uh, with my colleagues a toolkit for the ethnographic uh, study of space called TESS, and that I actually go around and train uh, local communities in using so that they can do their own kind of ethnography. So what, what this background did for me um, um, was to give me a sense. I was always asked like, what is a good public space? From the very beginning, when I was teaching landscape architecture and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania, I was always being asked, what is a good public space, Seth, or what should I do? And I wouldn't answer that I'm an, you know, I'm a social scientist. I wanted empirical evidence um, that I really wanted to understand public spaces, and I didn't feel like I knew enough. But after all of that work collectively, I began to feel that I needed to speak up. I needed to use my voice as well to say what I had found and what I thought good public space was. And I needed to have an answer when people came to me and say, well, what for me is a good public space? What am I trying to design? And of course, our first question is good for home. Um, so, I mean, after asking good for home, I still had to come up with something and I have, uh, share this with you again. Um, this is very similar um, uh, to Julian's sort of thing, but I am interested in creating public spaces for everyone, for all. And because it provides an opportunity for social interaction, especially among people who would not normally encounter one another. I think that this is the, the basis of of the possibility of democracy, be it cooperative or conflictual. Um, it is the center for problem solving and it is the basis of a socially just and inclusive society. Um, and in um, the, uh, the next move from this is the book I'm working on now, which is called let me just, um, uh, Public Space Matters. Um, and I've been trying to explain, so how do you make how, how is it that we create these inclusive, uh, vital uh, public spaces? And this is very, very crude um, sort of graphic. Uh, this is a reiterative project uh, process, but what I wanted to point out that um, what I'm saying and why public space matters that, that, there, that, that the good public space, that there are antecedents, of course, a history, demographics, policies, geography, environmental factors. And there are these outcomes that we're interested in, the health, the resilience, the sustainability, social justice, the one I'm most interested in, creativity, social cohesion. I could put so many lists on the, the, the way in which public space um, uh, uh, contributes to a flourishing society. But how, how is it that we get? And I know that many of us know that it's contact among people who don't necessarily know each other that is really critically important. But I really didn't feel or don't feel, and that's where I've come to, that that's enough. I think that people can come into contact and still not produce the kind of solidarity, resilience, the kinds of things that we're really talking about and wanting to promote in public space, that it takes two more elements. And that's what this, most recent work is about. One is public culture 
and the second is a particular kind of affective atmosphere. And that we need contact, public culture, and, a, and a certain kinds of affective atmospheres in order to get to the sustainability and social justice that we argue is an outcome of socially just public space. So just, I, uh, just a moment to say just a tiny bit about contact. Um, which means connection, circulation, communication. This is a, um, a parade, a, a festival in Kerala in the south of India. Um, but the important thing is that we have 60 years now, I think it is, Julian, 60 years of evidence that intergroup contact um, is an agent of liberalization, of people uh, being uh, reducing prejudice, promoting social harmony. It, it, you don't even have to talk to one another. Even that can improve flexible thinking, creativity, problem solving. Um, Contact in and of itself is a liberalizing agent and it shapes human cognition. And contact is good for a lot more than we've ever recognized. And it's little by little becoming a central theory of, of human psychology. So it's not a surprise um, that contact is important. I mean, we're right about that. Um, but there is more I would argue than contact because contact can occur and not become anything. And that's where public culture, I think, comes into play. I mean, uh, public spaces, this is my plaza, uh, the, uh, this is my plaza central that I was talking about before, are symbols of civic life. They're forms for discussion. That's where recognition occurs and information circulates. It's where the inclusion of counter publics can occur. And um, and can in fact work towards the expansion of the public sphere. Um, so public, public culture, I'm arguing, is this dynamic negotiation of beliefs and practices um, that happen when people come into contact but create norms of open access and response. And these negotiations involve conflict, fights, contestation, and all kinds of race, class, and gender struggle, but they also include community building, collaboration, and the social construction of meaning. Um, their social, uh, public culture is socially produced, um, but it mediates, I would argue, the relationship between public space and the public sphere. By that, I mean it mediates how public space in fact, influences the entire sort of political dimension and communication and circulation of ideas in society, the public sphere, as we talk about. And there's one more piece. This I have less worked out, but um, I've recently added it based on uh, Anna, Anna Barker's work and some work by Ben Anderson that I'm quite familiar with. I mean, I talk about affective atmosphere and spatializing culture, but I hadn't talked about its importance in public space. And what I mean is the ambience, the emotional tone, the sound and smell, what people say about a space, but particularly events taking place. Um, you imagine being in the Bronx of New York and the Yankees went, you're next to the, in the Bronx, in the Yankee stadium, and the Yankees win versus the uh, Yankees lose. Think about the nature of social interaction that occurs in those two situations. When they win, everyone's high fine, uh, everybody's honking their horn, people freely talk to one another, um, maybe even hug each other in some cases, maybe not during COVID, um, but there is a certain sense of atmosphere and freedom that pervades the space and makes social interaction and the possibility of public culture more possible versus when they lose, where everyone's quiet and nobody talks to each other, everyone is disappointed. So I, I'm, what I guess I'm arguing is there, you know, during 9-11, there was some very negative affective atmosphere, but in public spaces, when people came together, they could produce an atmosphere of care. So I think we need to be thinking about affect as well. And here is Anna Barker feels that affective atmospheres create conviviality. This is a term that they use a lot more in Europe, uh, uh, this notion of feeling connected, a uh, kind of a, a mutual infinity, uh, affinity to place and promotes indifference to difference.
She feels that it really, that the affective atmosphere can make a difference when people come together, that difference becomes less important. And of course, Ben Anderson has, has always been talking about affective atmosphere. And he's he sees it as a part of the formation of, of subjectivities. So that's kind of my theory of how we get to public space and why it matters. But it still brings me back to my uh, initial question, which I haven't answered, which is, what is good public space? And I would say good public space outcomes, however we want to define it, equals uh, just public space. And it still brings me back to the question uh, that I am trying to answer is how can we create this just and inclusive space? What criteria should we use to evaluate it? How can we improve the spaces we have and that we need to develop a framework? And very quickly, I'd like to show you this framework and give uh, talk about some of the details. Um, so um, I did start with just city models. I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, certainly Susan Feinstein's work on the just city and Ruth Fincher and Kirk Giveson and uh, Peter Marcuse have talked about the just city. The problem with the discussions of just city, it's not that they don't work, it's that they don't work enough when I go down to the scale of public space. I hope this is clear, there, there's a normative goal and I, I want normative goals. I want something we're reaching for that's value laden. And it works, these ideas work very well at the city scale, but one, Feinstein's only talking about distributive justice. And two, again, the scale doesn't work when we want to talk about specific public spaces, if you want to look at the public space in your neighborhood. Um, so I began to pull from Rawls and Iris Young and Honan and trying to think about uh, comparative evaluation, social values, notions of recognition and participatory equality, avoidance of humiliation and disrespect. And of course, also reading the work of David Harvey and uh, uh, Ed Soja who are talking about spatial justice um, and bringing us to more territorial understandings of what the just, uh, just city would be. I love this quote from Soja, um, which is um, that unjust geographies are the way that people experience the negative effects of an unjust society. So I feel like if we start with a, a just public space and you know, we are in fact, at least feeding back, not the same old, same old um, uh, 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 social segregation, social exclusionary. But none of these models took me far enough. And so I began to work at work psychology in where there is a focus on what is fair in an organizational set, setting. And in red, I'm not, the, in their work, they found that you can't just look at distributional justice to understand an organization or an organizational culture, but you need to think about procedural justice, interactional justice, informational justice. And they found by this huge meta-analysis that that such attributes as trust, help, helping, courtesy, positive effects will, are, are outcomes of these kinds of justice attributes. And then to finish my framework, I went back to my ethnographies and the work that I previously looked, and I included two additional elements that are not in the work psychology or the more psychological organizational framework, recognition of difference and uh, an ethic of care and repair. Um, the ethic of care and repair came from um, my many students and being involved in Occupy Wall Street and care and repair, as you all know, comes very is very heavily, very prominent in the environmental justice literature is a key piece. And so here's, uh, I developed this framework um, of distrib these are the uh, elements of a, a framework that I'm arguing you, we can use to both evaluate public space, but we can also use it to produce more socially just uh, spaces. Um, I really started with evaluation, looking at the spaces that are there, and uh, my examples um, will give you some ideas. So distributive justice, which is uh, the, the considers how 
wealth, rewards, benefits, and burdens should be distributed to achieve a just uh, uh, city. And here we have the Bronx. This is at the site specific level. Remember, I wanted a, a framework we could use at the site level, not just the city level. This is what I mean by site level, uh, a deteriorating playground in the Bronx and a well-maintained Central Park in Manhattan, uh, an unequal appropriation money. That's distributive justice. But distributive justice at a citywide center is, this is a um, ambulatory vendors, uh, demonstrating uh, uh, for access to public space to make a living in Argentina, where they make up 60% of the informal economy of Argentina and were banned from public spaces. So this is a, a citywide protest. So the distributive justice means that people should have places to work. And this is a um, the restaurants in Yangon. Um, in um, Myanmar where they are uh, periodically cleared off by the police. So distributive justice isn't just, you know, the deterioration and equality of having public spaces, but also in having the right to work throughout the city. Um, procedural justice is, takes its, its form from court systems, that it is the procedure of the decision-making, not just the decision that is important in perceived justice. Um, and I really, I don't have time to go, I definitely don't have time to go through this example, but this is um, a site-specific example in the Mission District in San Francisco, where youth of color, particularly Latino youth, had used a soccer field for, I don't know, 40 years, and the city came in and uh, reseeded it and renovated it, and then suddenly, without the youth knowing, put all kinds of rules that it suddenly cost $27 to use the space, and one day they went for a drop-in game of soccer, and men in Dropbox suits, you know, the company of Dropbox were there and telling the kids they could no longer play there. Um, this was a lack of procedural justice. The, the youth who had been using it, that community had no voice, and it got, and it, and there was a protest, and they now have access, but the idea of procedural justice um, all, uh, is always one in which the local neighborhood or local inhabitants don't have any voice in changing the procedures. And this is here illustrating the street and sidewalk appropriation in San Francisco by Google buses and by all the tech, tech companies who are taking over San Francisco, putting bikes on the sidewalks, uh, uh, having their private buses pick them up so public bus lanes aren't there and literally taking the neighborhood away from people without any, uh, any, any procedure of how streets should be managed and how sidewalks managed and for whom those sidewalks and um, streets should be for. Now, interactional justice takes two forms. Um, earlier in my work, I think the first time I wrote about this, I was just one, but I think it's worth thinking about interpersonal justice. This is Costa Rica up here on the top. These are Nicaraguan. Uh, Nicaraguans are, are immigrants. They are uh, uh, treated incredibly badly. And these are police being uh, disrupting them when they're just sitting around having a nice Sunday in the park. And down at the bottom is a picture from uh, Long Island. We're out where I am at this point. And these are Latino workers hoping to find work who are constantly harassed for being on the sidewalk. And that's interpersonal justice, that they are not treated in a fair way by the authorities or by the rules. But the, uh, And this is at the citywide level. These are NYU students protesting racial profiling. And the bottom is a cartoon from Arizona about stopping a visitor and checking his color um, to see if he could belong in the national park. Um, but there's also informational justice. Um, in other words, not everyone gets the same information, much less is it truthful. Um, there's an example from Prospect Park where they put up a snow fence uh, that splits Prospect Park in half. And on the one side of the park, um, uh, the sort of white professional uh, 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 park slopers uh, really kind of knew it was for an ecological renovation 
of the park. Um, however, the other side of the park, which happens to be heavily Caribbean American, African American, um, in general poor and not as gentrified, saw those snow fences as keeping them out. And um, as you can see, the park managers had never really spoken um, and had not given adequate information about why this area was being closed. Other kinds of informational justice. Here is a, uh, um, a statue actually really near where I live um, in Prospect Park that identifies Lafayette and um, that, but the person that he is with is not. Um, whoa, I just, I need to go previous. And here is informational justice citywide. Um, informational justice is, uh, communication should be truthful, justified, adequate. Think of, all the t think of all the importance of that right now for informational justice. We don't always have informational justice. And certainly we know neighborhoods do not sometimes have. And here is the UN Plaza with all the people and no eating allowed and all the signs are only in English. That is informational injustice. Recognition of difference, I think, is something that Julian talks a lot, so I know you're all quite familiar, but I think one of the things we must always keep in mind is that there are assumptions, underlying behavioral norms that accrue to one cultural group, usually white middle class, again, in this expanded notion, and those behavioral norms undermine other norms and ways of being of people who are in other people who are in public space who may in fact have different norms and different ways of being. And so the pursuit of equality involves working against cultural patterns that systematically deprecate some categories of people and the qualities associated with them. This is from Nancy Frazier, but I would even say even the, not the categories of people and the qualities, but the behaviors as well. And recognition of differences. These are young men sparring up in uh, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, the police came and did not, again, recognize that sparring is part of uh, these young men's form of play. Um, I don't have time to go into other examples, but um, uh, recognition of difference also is a citywide phenomenon. Groups can feel that their values and needs ought to be taken into account, but they're very often overlooked. And here we have Lewinsky Park in Tel Aviv, um, where Sudanese immigrants are living or spending the day because they're not allowed to work or be with their families in state-sponsored shelters. Um, you may know about this prime, and here they are in public space. Their, their differences recognized, their needs are not recognized. And this is a cartonero in Chile. Um, cartoneros are those who pick up the trash and they are losing access to public spaces where they collect trash that's the basis of their livelihood. I want you to see that I wanna, I constantly keep bringing up work because we think of public spaces and streets and whatever only as places somehow of leisure, or play, but they are also places of work and, pro and provide the livelihood for so many people. And the last dimension, of my model is the ethic of care and repair. I draw from Toronto's uh, philosophy of democracy that once a democratic society makes a commitment to it, the equality of its members, then the ways in which the inequalities of care affect different system, citizens' capacities to be equal has to be a central part of society's political tasks. And Occupy Wall Street, of which I was involved in, but even more, all my students were involved in and organized, was based on a politics of care, uh, ensuring that everyone had a safe place to sleep, access to communication, uh, technology, collective meals. And uh, it really struck me as incredibly important. Um, I, let me not also say that the ethic of care and repair heavily draws upon environmental justice and injustice and from feminist theory. Uh, but uh, site specific on, on public spaces, here's Costa Rica, people cleaning up, allowing one another to sleep, um, making it a safe space for all, making sure um, that, that the place is a place of kindness and, and um, as Cornel West would say, love. 
Um, but caring also contributes to a social just atmosphere. Here we have, um, uh, this is an open university in New York City. And here we have volunteers um, building barriers to protect the beach in the Rockaways uh, post Sandy. So I just come to my 30 minutes. I won't get to my example maybe, uh, but let's just take a moment and come back together and say, well, you know, why is Setha doing this? Because what this allows me to do, and I guess I will show you for just a moment. It, it allows me to ask a set of questions that I, that I, that are based on my own work that I know get to the basis of what makes just an inclusive public space, um, but that I can actually look at empirically uh, since I am a researcher and uh, say to someone, this is not just, or this won't produce the kind of just space. And, you know, I missed a slide. There's a slide in there that, you know, for me, what makes a good space is that it's just. So distributive justice, how can public space be distributed fairly? And what does that look like? How can we include community members in our procedures of allocation and use and interactional? How can we make sure that there are improved social relations? That's so important. And use conflict as the beginning of a co-production process. Um, how can we have, make sure communications are truthful and adequate? How can we create a social environment of respect and dignity? recognition of difference? How do we expand our norms of behavior to accommodate the diversity of behaviors and users and ethic of care? How can we promote more so pro-social behavior of care of others, repair of the environment and stop destroying, I, which we didn't, I didn't get to talk about today, care relations that might already exist. So that's the end. I was going to show you Tonkin Square Park. It's a struggle, but, and I was asked, why residents don't want the fences to be lowered. They don't want the fences to be lowered. And dozens of people came to a meeting. And so I did a test, this toolkit, and found multiple factors that were creating this sense of fear. All these senses of fear, bathroom for drugs, danger at night, homeless population getting dinner at one quarter, loud traffic, all the kind, large rat population and original design. So I could identify what was making, what was creating this affective atmosphere. There we go, an affective atmosphere and not allowing a public culture to develop that was successful and inclusive in Tompkins Park. But more importantly, I then, and I don't have time to go through it, but I'll leave this slide up if you want for a moment, doing a social justice analysis of the park allowed me to tell the park what they should be doing that was promoting this in both an unjust environment that was fearful and that did not allow a kind of positive uh, public culture to evolve. I mean, there was a lack of rat control, distributional rat control. I mean, only certain part communities got rat control. There is no hom homeless for uh, homeless housing. Um, people were not involved in procedures of decision making. There's all kinds of, there's a lack of personal injustice between users. In fact, I even promoted a kind of bringing users together. There was a lack of informational justice about who people were doing and what the motives were of city council uh, because of previous gentrification, on and on and on. That what I found was in testing uh, my, um, testing this, that um, you could use a social justice analysis to say to the city or to say to the uh, parks department, you know, these are the things that we really need to do. You can't just not take down the fence or put up a fence in Tompkins uh, Square Park. You have to address the basis of social justice there, and then we can change the fence. Thank you. So how do we go from here? Can you? How do we go from this? Well, we um, have got a lot of questions for you. Okay, um, I, let me see if I can see. Oh my goodness. No, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the question, Seth, don't worry. Okay. You, you just okay. answer them, I'll ask them. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, Aida asks, she's curious about learning more about procedural justice. She says, is it really a type of justice if the procedure 
has to occur in order to achieve the justice? Oh, that's interesting. I don't actually know how to answer you. That's a really good question. Um, Is I Aida, guess, Aida I, I want guess, to? Yeah, Aida, yeah. I think that, I guess what I'm saying, that often, often the communities aren't involved in the decision making or the individuals. And there are decisions, Aida, that are being made. Ju justice isn't a kind of static thing. What procedural justice is really arguing, as we all know through participatory planning and design, that without the participation of everyone, it's never really going to be just because people aren't given voice. Does that make sense? So there is no, for me, justice is even produced by that, by that discussion. Um, Julian, I don't know what, it, 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 you know, that the whole notion of participation, the whole notion that we share and that we co-produce, I, I think that the addition of procedural justice, I have to say to you that procedural justice can be used in the wrong way. In other words, you could have a really great procedure and still not a very fair distribution. That's part of why I have so many pieces to my puzzle. Does that make sense? You could be, you could, it doesn't always work, you know, these are different pieces that have to come together. Great, thanks, Setha. So um, Lily Link asks you, um, she says, white supremacy has created a system of safety in public parks that relies on borders, constraints on acceptable behavior and policing both by actual police and by white people who um, act like barbecue Becky. What would safety look like in a truly just public space? How would safety be performed through the physical infrastructure and cultural norms? I don't even, I, I think hmm, that's a great question. I mean, it's a great question. Do we know exactly? Certainly we have been anesthetized, anesthetized, I didn't pronounce that well, with this, I would call it white public space. So what would just public space really look like? I mean, I think we have some, uh, some glimmers, glimpses of that. Um, I think that Prospect Park is actually more just than Central Park. I think it would be very diverse. I think it would not have much policing. I think it would have more community involvement. Um, plazas self-regulate pretty well. Um, when they're not messed with. I mean, um, I don't know, do you have an example? I want to turn to you and can you think of a just, a, a really just public space and what it would look like? I think it's going to look very different. Yeah. I think I have a talk where I talk about yeah. community policing, um, everything being free. Um, probably there's more programming. You know, you can't pretend it's going to happen by magic. Often you will have to have uh, uh, different kinds of programming, things that will draw people together, um, maybe some kinds of problem solving. I mean, that's a huge question, um, but isn't that what we're reaching for? Well, Seth, I think, you know, I mean, you mentioned co-production so many times. I think if we co-designed, co-managed and co-programmed public spaces with communities, that might change the, the dynamic of those spaces. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Because I was going to ask yeah, you- but, 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 that, but here's, I agree. I don't disagree. We're on the same page about this. Where we're, we've never had time to discuss where, I, I have another presentation that I also thought of giving and where I was talking about what are really the threats. I mean, the threats are, everybody wants to be secure, everyone. I want you to know it, it, it isn't, just the white middle class is not the only group that wants to be secure. You go interview anywhere in the world, I don't care where I go, people want to be safe and secure, but they mean different things by it and it can be achieved in very different ways. So, um, but so I think that we're also confronting pressures of certain ways and modes of design that we haven't even opened up the capacity to imagine different kinds of safety and security that is formed through social relations rather than formed through policing. I don't think we found ways of funding parks that aren't through privatization. I don't think 
I think that right now with COVID, we have exaggerated the separation and, and the fear of others and the stigmatizing and stereotyping. Think of people who wear masks or don't have masks. I think it's become really complicated that co-production in and of itself, Jillian, may help. It's a step, but I think we have to also confront some of the urban dynamics of development that are already occurring that that threaten the very that very process that process could still be undermined by the policies of of private property or the policies of policing or the desire, the, the mystique of security that, that I've written about. I mean, it's very seductive, this idea of safety and security. And there is no one that doesn't want it. So how do we provide safety and security for all? Great, great I mean, answer. Yeah. Um, another question we have here from uh, Victoria. How different are the dynamics of public space between dense urban areas and suburban areas? <laughs> very different. I mean, very, very different. And COVID has, has shown us that in what sense. Uh, I would still use the same principles. I mean, uh, I, I, we, I mostly study dense urban areas where this conversation I think you're mostly familiar with. But I also have worked a lot in suburban areas, even worked on corporate uh, and malls and things like that. And I think that the biggest threat to suburbia is, is the land distribution, land ownership, and the inability of there to be any true public spaces. Suburbia suffers from a kind of limitation of public spaces and a great uh, expansion of the uh, private realm because so much of it was planned. And so much of it is owned collectively and own collective ownership, which you would think would really work like homeowners associations or common interest development. And this is another talk, but le I learned it from gated communities. People collectively owning things can create a cooperative that would be everything you would dream about. <clears throat> but when it's all one kind of people and it's run by a corporate board is an even more exclusionary uh, model. Suburbs are built on homogeneity of income, if not of race and class and built on very rigid uh, gendered models. Um, so public space in the suburb suffers from all those same constraints and even more so because so much of it is privately developed also has this additional constraint of this homeowners association, this collective ownership of property, which sounds wonderful, but when you study in depth creates even, uh, you know, it's people like us. We only want people like us. We want to keep others out that kind of mentality pervades the suburbs. In fact, the suburbs were built on that. Great. I don't know if that's a very clear, that wasn't a very clear answer, but you got bits and pieces. We got a question from MJB. Um, do you see control of use of public space as best managed by a group of diverse users? Have you studied any models for managing public space? Um, I have not studied any. I do think that there are, um, a, a, models evolving. There, there have been models where conservancies have brought in, I mean, Prospect Park, if the head of it was here, she would argue she has a diverse group in her board. I would argue she has no idea what diversity means <laughs> by the diversity of her board. I mean, a, a, a lot of parks and things have used that. Um, I think that that would help. I, I'm actually involved in a, a project in reviewing a governance project about what public governance would look like. Um, I really would uh, refer you to uh, Matt, uh, Matthew Car uh, Carmona, who is uh, studying urban governance and has an idea of some kind of public person who is going to do it. And that's what he thinks will work. I, I, I am skeptical right now about all the models we have. And even remember a group of representatives of the community can 
without an open mind and without constantly asking these social justice questions can get themselves in trouble. I mean, that's why the social justice questions, even for a group of, of residents or diverse users, it would certainly improve things, but still um, prejudice abounds in all groups and community is very complex right. and prejudice invades all kinds of things. It isn't just it isn't just racial, it's also class, gendered, abilityed, um, sexed, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, so Kristin Scrabbert, um, our resident anthropologist, asks um, or tells you, ethnography is a historically a long-term embedded research method conducted by a lone ethnographer. Can you speak right. how ethnography <laughs> changes both the process as an, and as a product through the context of the uh, processes you mentioned, REAP and TESS? Very good question. Um, take, I could spend a day with it. And, and now, I mean, I would add to that, to your question. I'm now teaching a course on uh, critical remote ethnography. What about uh, ethnography that is as virtual as is, is in place? I think that uh, for a PhD in anthropology, the model of going for a year and studying a place is, is, is wonderful, but I think it is um, not going to be the ethnography of the future if we want ethnography to make a difference in the world. Personally, that's what I think. I think we need a, a much more engaged, engaged model of ethnography or even what some have called a fugitive or protest version of ethnography um, that will be collective, that will be, collab I think we need to think about ethnography more as a collaboration rather than the sole practitioner. And I have certainly been, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I haven't gone out there as that sole practitioner, but I think it's always a collaborative project. Um, I think it's one that um, in which we need to situate ourselves um, as individuals in uh, much clearer ways. We know that the injustices of social science against all kinds of people, stereotyping, not uh, all peoples of color, marginalized, but all kinds of people, uh, uh, different abilities um, doesn't work. Um, but I will fight for that REAP, which is always done as a group with community members and a variety of people who are usually quite different because we often need different languages that go into an area for a short period of time that work on a snapshot and then is given back to the community is one new kind of engaged model we can use. And then the toolkit, which is even shorter, um, is given to community members. And maybe these are shortcuts. One could argue um, that they only give you one moment in time, but I think they, they will allow the public um, and the neighborhoods to do their own ethnographic work in a moment in time in which we're all doing our own autoethnography. I mean, we're all going online, writing about ourselves in places. Isn't that our own ethnography? Great points. And Seth, I mean, again, I'm going to push you on co-production, co-produced ethnographies. Uh, yes. University of Sheffield. Collaborative. Yeah, yeah, collaborative, yeah. University of Sheffield Landscape Design Department in the UK is looking at that with refugee groups, with uh, various right. immigrant groups uh, who are using parks and public spaces. So, so you, it's called collaborative ethnography. Rich, that's Rich Fine, right? Yes, I've contacted her, right? And, that's right. and um, the, I think, but I, um, there is a whole book, uh, there, is, there are books of collaborative ethnography, it, even in the US context, there's, it's been around for a long time, but um, the elite uh, academic model has, you know, reinforced the, the lone male out there, the lone male even, and the lone male out there toughing it out learning the real truths. I, I think that there's great skepticism now, even that, 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 I mean, John Jackson, if any of you know his work at University of Pennsylvania, it gave a talk at, or was interviewed in my class this week. And then John points out, you know, we're all our own ethnographers. And, and how, can we still say that there is such a thing as thick description that the anthropologist can spend a year and somehow know 
more or know different or know the deep crevices of, a, of another group of people better than they know themselves. I mean, the hubris, I mean, anthropology doesn't have such a clean history. You know, it's one of colonization, right? It doesn't, it's one of colonization. So collaborative ethnography or uh, participatory action, uh, 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 participatory action research or some of these models, though I've not always been part of them, you know, um, I really feel that for the future of ethnography will, will be in some of these methods and I hope that my tests and the way I use REAP will help to provide some models for including, um, for working in public spaces more effectively than we've been able to. Great. Well, Seth, uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, expansive. Um, you know, you're talking about anthropology as uh, its history not being so illustrious in parts. I remember as a, an undergraduate, I took a, a minor in anthropology and it was all about measuring people's craniums and it was a horrific <laughs> and racist. But what's interesting is like geography, where I come from, we've had the best and the worst of our subjects. I mean, geographers yeah. have been some of the most uh, racist and supremacist individuals as of anthropologists but I think with people like yourself Setha uh, and Kristen we are moving into a very very different more liberatory anthropology and geography and yeah. urban planning thanks everyone for coming next yeah. Wednesday we have Jay Pitter exploring invisible women's syndrome um, that's on March the 10th please come but can we give a UEP um, hands up to Setha please for a great presentation Thank you so much. Thank you. Take I care. I can't hear anybody. That's the saddest part. <laughs> See you later. Stay safe. Bye. And Julian will co-produce co, co, co produce together. <laughs>